it's easy to imagine the Apostle Paul with the Torah scroll next to him opened up to the book of Genesis as he wrote his letter to the Galatians. He returns time and again to the life of Abraham and his arguments against the first century Judaizers who taught that followers of Jesus were required to keep the law of Moses. And Paul masterfully uses the Torah to disprove their false application of the Torah. And that makes the book of Galatians especially relevant in defeating the theology taught by modern day Torah keeping Christians. And today we're going to focus on this provocative allegory that we find at the end of Galatians 4 and see how it directly applies to our Hebrew roots friends today. Let's start by just reading through this entire passage, then we'll go back and unpack it verse by verse. So, Galatians 4, starting at verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son, born according to the flesh, persecuted the son, born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Wow. This is a densely packed passage, and what Paul's doing here, and he states it outright, is creating an allegory. He uses characters and events from the book of Genesis to symbolically teach biblical truth. And to make sure we fully understand the allegory, let's first take a brief sidebar and remind ourselves of the events that Paul's referencing. And if you've ever been tempted to think that the Bible's boring, check out this Jerry Springer episode. Okay, I'm going to lay this out on the chalkboard here so we can track the relationships that Paul's referring to and really see the contrast that he makes. So here we have Abraham, okay, Abe, and in Genesis 15, God promised Abraham that he would have a son of his own flesh and that his descendants would be like the stars in the sky at night. But for several years, nothing happened. And then Abraham's wife, Sarah... Okay, put Sarah, all right, wife. She grew impatient, and in Genesis 16, 2, she told Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, while this might have been an acceptable act culturally at the time, particularly because the continuation of family lines was so vital, it certainly wasn't the will of God. So when Sarah's Egyptian servant, Hagar, we'll do Hagar, okay, servant, oops. When she became pregnant, it caused Sarah to despise her. In fact, Sarah began to treat her so harshly that she ran away. But God came to Hagar and sent her back to Abraham, promising that he would take care of her and the baby. So Hagar returned to the household, right? And she gave birth now to a son named Ishmael, okay? This is Ish down here, Ishmael. Then, years later, Yahweh came to Abraham again and promised him a son by his wife, Sarah, and that this would be the heir heir through which the, the blessings would come to all the peoples of the earth. So Sarah, who was 89 years old at the time, laughed at the idea. (laughs) 
Therefore, God told them to name their son Yitzhak, Isaac, which means one who laughs. And when Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham was 100, their promised son, Isaac, Isaac was born, right? And this created a new problem. So Ishmael had been Abraham's only son for 14 years. And when Isaac arrived, Ishmael became jealous, right? So he began to mock Isaac and cause trouble in the home. And Sarah told Abraham to send, our Hagar, to send Hagar and Ishmael away, which broke Abraham's heart. So in Genesis 21, verses 12 and 13, we read this. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham obeyed and packed up provisions and sent them away, right? And as Hagar and Ishmael wandered in the wilderness, God came to them and he cared for them. Okay, with this drama in mind, let's return to Galatians 4 and work through Paul's allegory. Now, he begins by asking in verse 21, You who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? The, the Galatians who were tempted to follow the teachings of the Judaizers and put themselves back under the law were rejecting God's gift and missing the purpose of the law, which Paul explained earlier in Galatians was to reveal our need for a savior and point us to Jesus, right? He's asking, do you not listen to the law? And with that, Paul picks up the story of Abraham that we just looked at. And notice how he refers to the two women here. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. So Hagar, the slave, bore Ishmael, right? And Sarah, the free, freely chosen wife of Abraham, bore Isaac, right? And Paul adds in verse 23, his son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. So let's put flesh over here and promise over here. The book of Galatians is a study of contrasts, and Paul's developing some here in this allegory. Now, when Paul describes Ishmael as born according to the flesh, he, he's not speaking of the physical aspect of the birth. I mean, both sons were born in the same way in that respect. Paul's drawing a contrast here. In this verse, he uses the term flesh, and the Greek word is sarx, to refer to sinful human nature. God had promised Abraham a son, but in their impatience and doubt, Sarah and Abraham took matters into their own hands. Rather than trusting God's promise, they resorted to works of the flesh. Now, by contrast, Isaac was born of Sarah, just as God had promised. Paul continues in uh, verse 24. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. So biblical authors rarely take the time to clearly explain their allegories and parables. And, and here we find a welcome exception. Paul openly reveals this allegory is about two covenants. The old covenant made at Sinai and the new covenant inaugurated by Jesus. And Paul says that Hagar, who symbolizes the old covenant, bears children who are to be slaves. So the imagery here is clear and for the Judaizers, scandalous. Paul says the law bears children into slavery. He then adds another layer to his allegory of Hagar. Verse 25. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia in chorus and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. Ah, the plot thickens. So Hagar stands for Mount Sinai, meaning she represents the law in this allegory. And she also symbolizes the present Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of Paul's day. So it's not hard to imagine gasps of protest in, in Galatia as these verses were being read out loud. At the time Paul wrote this letter, the city of Jerusalem was the active epicenter of the Jewish faith. 
the temple was still standing and fully operational, and Jews still made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times every year for the feasts. And and synagogues throughout the world were, were built so that they faced Jerusalem. Yet Paul describes that vibrant city as in slavery with her children in verse 26. This brings to mind the words Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well in uh, John 4, starting at verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So just 20 years before Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians, Jesus foretold that the temple in Jerusalem would cease to be the epicenter of the worship of God. Under the new covenant, proper worship was no longer restricted to a a geographic location. It was done in the spirit and in truth. And what Jesus prophesied came to pass. So in Galatians 4, verse 25, Paul says, Hagar symbolizes the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Now, in the first century Roman Empire, children born to slaves were also slaves unless the master adopted them into his family. And what's really cool is that earlier in this chapter, in verses 4 and 5, Paul wrote, God sent his son to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. And in this allegory, he shows that just as Hagar was a slave and gave birth to a a child who was a slave, the present Jerusalem is now in slavery with her children. Paul is speaking of his, his fellow Jews who were refusing the gift of grace that God offered them through Jesus, and so they remained under what he calls the slavery of the law. Now, by contrast, he says in verse 26, The Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. And then he quotes from the prophet. This is from Isaiah 54, 1. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. So unless we're particularly familiar with the book of Isaiah, Paul's use of this quote can be a little perplexing. What's he trying to say? Well, Paul's using a classic rabbinic technique in which a teacher quotes only part of a verse, knowing those disciples who are familiar with the passage will fill in the rest. Jesus did this a lot, right? It's kind of like today. If we were to simply say, what goes up? The the other person would instinctively know the rest of that proverb without us having to say, must come down, right? This is why it's so important for us to be familiar with our Old Testament. There's so much New Testament goodness that we miss otherwise. So if you're reading a Bible with cross-references, it'll show you which Old Testament passages is being quoted in the New Testament. And when you come across a cross-reference, it's super helpful and even eye-opening to then go back and read the passage or even the entire chapter in the Old Testament where that quote came from. Now, in this case, Paul has cited the opening verse of Isaiah chapter 54. And in that chapter, the prophet personifies Jerusalem as a woman, barren and and bereaved of children. And Paul knows his readers will recognize this as a chapter that goes on to speak of the future glory of Israel. Isaiah goes on to tell the barren woman in the very next verse, verse 2, For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations. So the idea Paul introduces from Isaiah is that God can bring abundant blessing where, humanly speaking, it seems impossible. It's the same principle behind Isaac being miraculously born to a barren 90-year-old Sarah. And Paul connects this same idea to Gentile believers who miraculously become heirs of God's promise to Abraham through faith, which he talked about at the end of uh, chapter 3. Now, more directly, Paul contrasts the... Uh, present Jerusalem, and we'll just put PJ here, who he says is in slavery with the Jerusalem above, and I'm just going to put JA here, that he says is free. So what does he mean by the Jerusalem above? Well, he's contrasting the old Jerusalem with what the book of Revelation calls the new Jerusalem. It's the messianic kingdom 
Alan Cole writes this, The concept of a new Jerusalem is very familiar from the Old Testament. In view of passages like Ezekiel 48 and Isaiah 62, it was easy to speak of an ideal Jerusalem already existing in heaven in the mind and purpose of God, and one day destined to be established on earth by the act of God. To Paul, the present Jerusalem is not only a familiar city of his boyhood with a temple at his heart, but also the whole race of Israel. Again, this was the familiar usage from the Old Testament where Jerusalem can stand for its inhabitants or even for the whole nation. So in Paul's allegory, the present city of Jerusalem in verse 25 symbolizes the Old Covenant, right? And the Jerusalem that is above in verse 26 represents the New Covenant. And Paul includes a curious phrase regarding the the, the Jerusalem above. He not only says it's free, but he adds, she is our mother in verse 26. Where did that come from? Well, it came directly from the passage he just cited in Isaiah 54, where, where it speaks of a mother who seems barren, but whose descendants will one day be so numerous that they dispossess dispossess nations. (laughs) Mothers give life. And back in chapter 3, Paul says that the law cannot give eternal life. Rather, life comes through faith in Jesus. And, And in Paul's allegory, life comes through Sarah, who represents the new covenant with his freedom and promise, right? Now, by contrast, the Judaizers wanted to claim the slave woman, Hagar, who represents the law of the old covenant, as their mother, right, their source of life. And by doing so, they were actually leading people away from the only source of eternal life there is, faith in Jesus. Abraham's marriage to Hagar was not God's will, right? It was the byproduct of unbelief, and Ishmael was a work of the flesh. It's the oldest story in the book. Abraham and Sarah didn't trust God and went their own way instead. They enlisted Hagar to do what only Sarah could, and it failed. Paul's allegory underscores what he's been teaching for the last two chapters in this book. The law is not, and was never intended to be, our source of life, or for that matter, our justification, or the source of our spiritual inheritance. And now Paul brings his allegory home for the Galatians. Verse 28, Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son, born according to the flesh, persecuted the son, born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. And there's another contrast, right? Ishmael was born according to the flesh, and Isaac was born by the power of the... Oh, put the Spirit here. By the power of the Spirit. He's contrasting the flesh and the Spirit, right? It's another contrast. And in the same way that Ishmael mocked his little brother Isaac and caused trouble in the home, the Judaizers were persecuting the believers in Galatia. The struggle for fidelity to God that was felt so acutely in Galatia continues to this day. We see it all the time on this channel. Torah-keeping Christians chastising and harassing their brothers and sisters in Christ for not eating kosher or or keeping the Torah feasts or the seventh-day Sabbath, right? That's exactly what the Judaizers were doing. And on a much broader scale, within the mainstream Christian church, there's tremendous social pressure from the progressive or liberal factions of the church to get with the times on issues like sexual ethics. In recent history, we've seen the Methodist denomination split over this issue and tremendous controversy around changes in the traditional Episcopal and Catholic positions. And in light of these modern controversies, Paul's counsel to the churches in Galatia is sobering. He he prescribes the same remedy for the mockers in Galatia that Ishmael received back in Genesis. Uh, Verse 30, But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Followers of Jesus are not children of the slave woman, the law, They are free children of promise. Galatians 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. 
Paul doesn't see law keeping as a as a secondary issue of religious preference. This this isn't this isn't an agree to disagree matter for Paul, right? He's already labeled it a perversion of the gospel of Christ in uh, chapter one verse seven, and he says it's not in line with the truth of the gospel in chapter two verse fourteen. This is a salvation matter. Because the stakes are so high, Paul points to Genesis and says, just like God cast out Hagar, the churches in Galatia ought to get rid of or send away the Judaizers, right? And this is the same remedy that Paul prescribed for the sexual immorality running rampant in the church in Corinth. He compared their immorality to yeast, and he wrote this in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and 7. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. There are certain teachings that, if allowed to spread throughout the church unchecked, will ultimately undermine the gospel of Jesus. And for Paul, it was the theology of the Judaizers who taught that all followers of Jesus were required to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And who holds that exact same position today? It's our Hebrew roots friends. Okay, now, according to our, our a modern chapter numbering, this brings us to the end of chapter 4, but as I read this passage, Paul's thought is actually concluded in the next verse, uh, Galatians 5.1, which says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a, a yoke of slavery. Paul says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, Christ has set you free. How can you possibly submit again to the slavery of the law? The same thing could be said today. Oh, you foolish Torah-keeping Christians, Christ has set you free. How can you possibly submit again to the slavery of the law? Thanks for tuning in. Shalom.